All right, boys and girls, we are back a little bit early, but that's all right. We started early, but uh, I'm sure I can fill space for a few seconds while we flutz around in the background. First of all, sorry for the audio problems earlier on. I was testing stuff. Um, there was a couple of updates that occurred on the software that I was using, and I wasn't getting, you know, I'm not too familiar with it. And of course, the my control board that I'm using didn't want to work properly. So it was like, yeah, great, thanks. Technical abilities was just like zero. But more importantly, I have with me is, it's one heck of a name, but you can call him Sabi. Uh, I'm sure he's all right with, him, with being called that. But um, if you guys don't know who he is, all right? So let me give you a little bit of background information. When I first did the International Space Station, uh, I did a transit and I was at the bottom of my road and there I was sat up with all my stuff and I just thought to myself, there's got to be an easier way of doing this. There has to be some kind of like information or website and so forth and so on. After digging through the internet and probably two years later, I discovered this guy and his website and this plethora of information and it got me in this kick of trying to Im image the International Space Station without a transit. Now, I've had some varying success and I had some amazing disasters and my partner in crime, um, Mac Murdoch, who was with me at the time, um, we, we had little ups and downs. So we just thought there's gotta be an easier way. So here is Saab, with all of the information that I'm gonna sit very, very quietly in the corner and just absorb it because I need this information. I wanna get this. So I'm gonna hand it over to you. Give us a bit of information about yourself. With a pleasure, thank you. Thanks Simon for having me and, and basically for Woodland Hills. It's, a, it's definitely a pleasure uh, to be on this platform. And yeah, ISS is, is a very, luckily it's becoming a really hot topic, I have to say, uh, lately. Um, and I would like only uh, to hope that I play in this uh, a tiny bit of role. So yes, so yes, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm originally from Hungary. So that's, that's where the weird name is from. Um, it's, 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 we Hungarian, we say Sabolj Nagy but I don't expect anybody to, to say it with me because it's just way too difficult. So I've been living in the UK for 11 years now uh, in the cloudy, rainy um, UK. So you can imagine it's quite a challenge to do anything from here. My passion just started a couple of years ago with just buying a telescope from a widescreen center. And, and it, just, it just started, you know, it's just taking off and, and, and I never expected. Uh, to be honest, to get even even where I am right now, and I don't intend to stop at all. So hopefully, hopefully it's just gonna keep on going in the future. Wait, how long have you been doing this for now? I bought my first telescope in 2013, but I haven't taken my first image till I think 2015. I think, but it was with the DSLR, and it was uh, yeah, it was miserable. I show you one photo. I will show you my first photograph, which. Wait, so you've, okay, so you've only been doing this for five years. Yeah, yeah. That's so correct. I've only been into astronomy for four years. It's, oh, that's just nuts. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I, I figured out that I think the, the secret to all this, or any kind of success is, is to narrow down your focus onto one subject, what you entirely love, and then you just go full on with, with that. I have many friends who does planetary, lunar imaging, deep sky photography. So they, they kind of do a bit of everything, but in return, you're not gonna be a master of anything as well. Which right. is, again, it's both, both ways is brilliant and I, and I like it to be honest. But, you know, I kind of, I really so like this topic so much that I just, I just nose dive into it and, and ever awesome. since I love it. All right, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> okay, right. So let me just put uh, this screen of mine. Just, uh, just confirm with me that you can see the presentation, the white screen. All right. Okay. So space station. Um, 
I will just do some introduction at the beginning quickly, what exactly the International Space Station is, just if some of you are not really familiar um, with it. And then, and, then, and then after that, we're gonna dive into the equipment side. So, okay, so, so there are some photographs, first of all. This is, this is our uh, outpost in space at the moment. This beautiful structure is basically a result of about a good 10 years of uh, construction in space. And uh, it became a place where all kind of beautiful things happen from science to you name it, lots of things. So if I have to define what the International Space Station is, it's basically a large spacecraft and it orbits around Earth and basically astronauts call it home. Um, but if I really want to uh, go a little bit further with that, then I would say it serves, a, it serves as a microgravity and uh, space environment and uh, research laboratory. Um, they conduct all kinds of sciences from biology, human biology, physics, astronomy, meteorology, and Earth observations of all sorts, basically. Um, this is at, at a very embryo stage of the International Space Station. On the bottom, we, you can see these uh, Zaria module and, uh, and on the top, no, sorry, uh, the very top is the Zvezda, on top of it, the Zaria module and, the, and on top of it is the Unity modules. So the Unity and the Zaria was the first one and when they docked, that's what we call the birth of the International Space Station. Um, this is the first crew, basically, uh, they occupied the space station for the very first time. And since this is how large the International Space Station grew. Oh, hold on a second, hold on yes. a second. They, 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 they can't see the actual presentation. Sorry, I misunderstood what the uh, comment was. Okay, okay, not a problem. Then I think I probably, um, right, uh, how do I, so the screen, okay, now I know that they can see is. They can Let see just... your web browser, not a but problem. they can't see the presentation. Not a problem. Well, I'm going to do, okay, can they see this now? The, the space stations? Uh, I can see the back of somebody's car. Ooh, okay, right. Okay, that's a technical problem then. Um, okay, let me just choose it again. Because, uh, okay, I know where the problem is. But I need to, okay, just give me one second. If I, okay, resume, uh, new share. And, okay, I'm sorry for the, that's okay. Okay, That's now okay. it should be all right. Nope, I, think. I still still I still see see your web browser. Seriously, okay. Um, Are you using Keynote? Uh, no, it's a. Uh, it's called a uh, fewer. Okay. Oh, just move it into that window where wherever the web browser is. That's exactly what I tried to do, and I don't know why it just did not. So this is exactly where the web browser is. So you oh. should. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on a second. What's going on then? Um, okay. Let me just close the browser. Now you don't tell no, me you we, see my we desktop. Still, we still see the browser. Ah, I know what you did. When you did the screen share, you picked the browser as the playback, not your desktop. So let's okay. restart the screen share. So uh, come out of your screen share. Okay. Just give me one second. So, okay. I paused. I said, uh, okay. How okay. Do I now, call? now I see your desktop. Now I see the presentation. Okay, that's all, all right. we need to see. <laughs> okay, we might have to back up now. Um, about Another five problem. slides, I think it was, is where we not lost a you. problem. Okay, so I'm not gonna show the slide. So this is this is the birth of the International Space Station. This is what it looks like basically uh, at the at the beginning, at the very beginning. By the way, you can see the International Space Station, the Lego one up there. So it's a good presentation. So okay, this is the first crew. They occupied the International Space Station, and this is how large it grew over the years. Obviously, it doesn't do uh, a best of justice because the panels are not sort of, they are facing this way instead of this way. Uh, that would do the real justice if we would see them from, from, the, uh, from the side, but you can still see the main structure, uh, it just grew large. Us in London, that's probably, a good uh, representation that how large the International Space Station is. That's the London Eye, basically, um, around the space station. And it's, it, okay, it just on. represents- Okay, hold on, we do have a problem. 
So when okay. you when you advance, nothing is advancing. It's just frozen. Wow. Okay. That's right. right. Shall I just okay. Uh, stop? Okay. Let's do sharing. this. Yes. Yeah, stop the share and mm -hmm. restart the screen share. Okay. But this time round, show your desktop, not any specific window. Okay. Okay. Now wiggle your mouse around. Okay. Now go back to the previous slide. Hold on. Okay, that's better. All right, it's moving now. Okay, we finally <laughs> got it figured out. Not a good start. <laughs> Anyways, <I know. laughs> but the devil is in the details. So yes, so this is a good um, scale sort of comparison, how large the International Space Station compared to certain um, rockets and the Statue of Liberty and our uh, London Eye. So that just gives you an insight look at how, how large in real life it is. I'll show you some interesting facts about the space station. So despite we all think that uh, gravity doesn't really act upon the space station, still 90% of Earth gravity is actually uh, having an effect on the, um, on the astronauts. But because they are constantly falling with the space station, they have this feeling that they are in uh, weightlessness, in microgravity. But yes, but gravity is still pretty much apparent, only 400 and 20 kilometers above the Earth. Um, some facts which I probably would highlight um, the orbital period. So it's 92 minutes to orbit the Earth once. And usually in books, you're going to find about orbits per day is 16. Um, but in mathematics, it's not everything round. Um, but let's just assume 16 times they go, it means that 16 times a day they witness sunrise and sunset, which probably for the human biology is not the best, because it's not what we get used to in, on planet Earth. And the other key information is that two, uh, the orbital decay is two kilometer per month. So because it's high above the Earth, um, Earth atmosphere, but uh, there are still some level of atmosphere around, and it still slows the International Space Station down. So every month they are losing about two kilometers of altitude and every now and then they need to reboost their altitude. Um, so that's probably an interesting fact. Um, okay, so how did I discover? Oh, real quick, do you know yes. how they get it back up into the, the orbit? Yes, usually I think they have their own thrusters and, uh, but not huge ones. And of course, uh, the docked Russian spacecrafts are the ones who are actually doing the heavy lifting. Gotcha. So um, they just they just pulse their um, rockets just to bring it back up into orbit. Basically, they turn the whole thing around, as far as I know, and they just fire the thrusters of uh, of whatever spacecraft is. I think it's at the aft uh, docking port at Zvezda, and then so they just flip the whole station around and then they flip it back again, um, which is interesting. It's definitely interesting. With the with the um, space shuttles, they used to just uh, do 90 degrees. So yeah, it's, they do these kind of tricks. Um, so yeah, how did I discover the International Space Station? So first of all, for myself, uh, buying a telescope was a key moment. Uh, probably without that, I, w I knew uh, from the news that they, they launched this you know, cargo ship or that cargo ship, but you know, we don't really pay attention unless you really start showing some interest. And then I saw some photos um, here and there on social media, internet. Uh, I would like to mention just a couple of names, Ralph Vanderberg, uh, Martin Lewis, and uh, Thierry Ligold. They all amazing and inspirational international space station photographers. They dragged me into this hobby. And then I realized that actually the space station can be seen by your naked eye. So you just, you just need to check exactly what time is it when the next flyby is around, you just go out and just watch it flying across the, the sky, which is brilliant because in the past, I think 18 years, it's been constantly occupied by humans. So there are always people living on board the space station, which I think that the human presence just, just brings it to a whole new level. I like spacecraft as well. But, you know, when humans involved, and that's why the Tomorrow's Demo, Demo 2 SpaceX launch is interesting because there are humans involved. So um, I took my first shot and it looked like this. And I finally say to everybody, I don't know who sees what. 
I definitely saw a skiing rabbit. <laughs> That's my first impression. So this is the, uh, the ear of the rabbit. This is the ski and this is the tail of the rabbit. <laughs> I don't know how I managed to take this shot, but it's just, it's just remarkable that it's, it's, it's a funny way of starting basically, or it's definitely anecdotal. Um, okay, so what is the point of, of going out every now and then and, and fighting with the bad forecast and, you know, the bad visibility in the UK? So first of all, I think it applies to astronomy in general, but it applies to this hobby as well. It's your own discovery. You are the one in the front line. You are the one who's doing it. You're not watching a video, you're not watching somebody else's photos. You actually outside with your real physical equipment and you actually immerse yourself into it. It's a brilliant thing. It's like gardening or you name it. It's, it's, it's recreational. Um, and of course, once, once there is an interest, you want to know more about it and you start reading about it and you dive into it and you get more and more information and that's how it just becomes more and more interesting. So where, where should we begin? First of all, we, uh, if somebody is interested about the International Space Station, you need to be familiar with its visibility. So we have periods. It's you know, a couple of weeks when we can observe it after sunset, or and then later there are periods when we cannot observe it at all, and then periods when we can see it before sunrise. So there is, uh, uh, it's related to its orbits and how it orbits around the Earth. So, but I will, sh I, I will mention a couple of websites where you can get very accurate um, information about the next flyby it from your location. Why do we see the International Space Station, sh space Station so bright? So the principle is that basically the sun has set or the sun is not yet risen and your background, i.e. the sky, is relatively dark. So because of that, uh, because of the International Space Station is so high above the surface of Earth that um, the sunlight still can illuminate it, basically. I have another photograph, well, uh, uh, um, a self-made sort of explanation uh, drawing. So that probably shows exactly what's going on. So despite somebody's at the dark side um, of, uh, of Earth or, or just off the sunset or be before sunrise, the sunshine still can illuminate the International Space Station, but I have a really good um, animation about it. So you're gonna see, it's gonna be hopefully in a loop. So you will see that as the space station gets into uh, the shadow, you will see that despite below, uh, down the earth is still right now, it's dark, you see the space station is still pretty much illuminated. So that is the principle behind seeing the space station or any object basically orbiting around the earth um, after sunset, sunrise, after sunset or before sunrise. And then we're gonna come back to this. Right, um, on my browser, I managed to close it, but we go back to it. So I run this website called spacestationguys.com and I made this website purposefully to explain people that how I do this imaging, uh, give them a little bit of idea um, what techniques I'm using, uh, what's the, the principle behind manual imaging, uh, so on and so forth. So here you can see in these slides, so this is me buying my first telescope. It was at an eight inch Newtonian on an equatorial mount, EQ5 mount. So this is definitely not the tool for international space station imaging, but it's perfectly feasible. Um, basically what I'm doing is before the flyby occurs with the EQ mount, you just set up the mount so that as you just turn it around, around this equatorial um, design, you're going to cover most of the flyby. It's not the most uh, desirable equipment for International Space Station imaging, but if you happen to have an EQ5 mount, any type is still um, feasible, but you don't need to polar align or anything because you are doing manual imaging. So just set it up. So look it up, uh, which part of the sky the space station going to fly through and just orientate yourself. You can just put the camera and just imitate the motion. 
and you know you, you set your scope the way that you're not gonna hit the legs you know you're not gonna be in a very awkward position and so on and so forth so there is a way to find it out but obviously for me it became immediately apparent that that this is not the right tool for me so um uh, but I still did not make a purposeful step for my Dobsonian because I think that's the best one. So I had a uh, 127 Maxutov, and I think I can show you a video me actually um, tracking the space station. I think, yeah, probably this is the better one. So I'm going to put it on mute. And in this video, you will see me setting it up. And so that's my small Maxutov. It's, it's on a Skywatcher all of you mount. I don't know how popular it is in America. It's just a simple, yep, altazimuth um, uh, tracking go-to mount, which is pretty clever because it, it has dual encoder in there. So despite it's tiny, it's really good, but not the new model. And on this one, so I was experimenting. You will see the ISS coming from somewhere here. And then I'm just basically, I'm just moving my telescope uh, so that I'm, I'm trying to, the, that's the ISS coming there, and I'm just moving my scope by hand. And because I'm using a high frame rate camera, I'm trying to capture as many good frames as possible, basically. That's the principle. But I realized that, again, a Maxutov telescope is too short. So as you just grab it, you cannot so fine movement, you cannot use fine movements uh, as it required to actually track the International Space Station. Some people, though, we, if you have a, a, an SCT or a Maxutov telescope, what they simply do is they, they put some kind of extension under the plate as you just put your um, scope into a mount and basically you just extend the whole thing. So as you turn it around with a stick, uh, you steer it. So it gives you a much more finer control over how you move your telescope. I personally tried a couple of times, but I failed. And but I do know people who are actually using C8 or even bigger telescopes with um, a broom, <laughs> basically, which sounds weird, but that's that is the case. Um, right. So what is the principle of um, of imaging? Basically, you need a couple of equipments. Um, in this video, I I explained all the equipments and I put a price tag on it because I do know that people are asking me about, about how much is it? It must be thousands of pounds. It must be because it's, you know, they just they just think that that it is. It's not. It's so the equipment you're gonna see in this video is all together without a laptop, it's eleven hundred pounds. So one thousand one hundred pounds altogether. So that includes a 10 inch Dobsonian telescope. It's a Skywatcher 250 flex tube telescope, which comes with a finder scope. But with a finder scope, I, I am actually not using the finder scope for tracking. And the whole reason for this, uh, there will be one moment when I'm, when I'm going to show uh, the finder scope as I put it on. Uh, sorry, just to, to get in the video. So that's my finder scope. And you will see that the finder scope is pretty much on top of my telescope. So as I'm grabbing the telescope, I like to just say I'm hugging it because I love it so much. So when I'm hugging it, I, in it if, if I want to track the ISS through the finder scope, I give you two reasons why not to. One is because you, you have to push your head close to the top of your telescope. So you're not concentrating actually on the movement, but you're concentrating on actually seeing something through the, through, um, the finder scope and the second bit is it's a mirror it's a flip image so it's it drove me nuts i know there are finder scopes that shows you the correct here i'm i'm putting my my head near the finder scope and so yeah so this is a no-go for me so i discovered the telrod this is a relatively costly equipment um not huge but but it's not ten 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 dollars um, but it's the best tool I could buy. With the Red Dot Finder, my main problem is that with the Red Dot Finder, basically, uh, when you're tracking the ISS, basically you are tracking by putting the red dot on the ISS. 
So basically, when you can't see ISS through your red dot finder is when it's in the in your view. And it, it didn't work for me. Again, some it's my work for some people, it didn't work for me. Instead, the tail rod is actually showing you concentric circles, three concentric circles. And then with the screws here, there are three screws, you can align. So it's a projected uh, image onto a glass plate. This is the glass plate. And then basically uh, you can look through from a distance. So from my comfortable position as I'm hogging the telescope and I'm kind of at the back of it, I can easily look through the tail rod. So I don't need to struggle at all. And then once you figure out that where it needs to be on the dots uh, in the tail rod and you just keep it somewhere there, then your job is relatively simple. But and every single time when I start imaging, uh, one of the main rule is that whatever aiming device you are using, let it be finder scope, let it be a, a red dot finder or a tail rod. The first thing is that you dead accurate align it with your main scope. Because otherwise you are going to take lovely photos of the night blank uh, sky. Uh, it happened to me, so I'm talking from experience. <laughs> so I sort of rushed it and, and then it just, you know, it's a fail, but we're not setting up for a fail. So take your time check it a couple of stars and then and then yeah just go for it second thing is focusing that's probably one of the things that's super 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 important because again if you don't you don't set the focus uh on the way you set it in advance and once it's set you are not worried about that you just lock with the screw with this screw just in the bottom. By the way, this telescope doesn't come with a dual focuser, so you need to upgrade it to a proper dual focuser. Uh, Crayford dual speed focuser, I think that's what it's called, because uh, the normal single speed is just not accurate enough. And uh, and focusing, I'm using a Betinov mask, and I'll show you some some uh, some uh, how it should look when you are uh, focused properly. Um, with the tube extensions, I use, uh, help me out with the proper term, please, Simon. I don't know what, uh, with, the, with the inner ring in there. Well, the, uh, well, that's just a reduction ring. So it's a two inch to an inch and a quarter eyepiece reduction ring. Okay, eyepiece reduction ring. But instead of using the two screws, there is one uh, which tightens the inside oh, copper the ring. They call them click locks. Click locks. Okay, yeah. I learned something. So Bar today. Barda makes one. Um, I'm trying to think of all the other people. You'll find them all over the place. I think Barda's the best one out of the whole lot for the click lock. Okay, okay. I really like this. So you don't twist it. You, there is there is still a big bloody screw up there, but but instead of just with two tiny screws and just locking it with with them putting a pressure, it's a proper all around uh, insertion. So that's that's a good way of uh, of uh, because when you're gonna do collimation, it does matter how you how well uh, the collimator inserted. I always have an eyepiece with me because sometimes uh, I'm use, so I'm using my finder scope with another telescope and it needs to set in a different way. So sometimes you just can't find uh, things with your camera, and then it's very handy to just have one spare eyepiece. It's a twenty millimeter eyepiece just to quickly find, you know, align it with my tail rod and then and with the finder scope, and then I can crack on with, with actually setting up with the camera. So that's one of the camera I'm using. That's a ZW Make, and it's an ASI 24 color camera. But in the same time, I'm using now a, a 174 mm uh, mono camera as well, and I'm just experimenting with the, with the second one, with the 174. Um, it's a high frame rate camera, at the, uh, USB 3 and with this current setup I can do around just over a hundred frames per second so over over I would say a two three minute flyby if I tend to follow follow it all around uh, it's a couple of thousands of frames and around between 12 and 15 gigabyte video so it's uh, uh, things get a little bit serious um, for a focal extender, I highly recommend Teleview products. This just works for me. Uh, I bought them from the start because I've been told that it's worth buying one. 
And I know some of the makes are doing some really good stuff, but I but I hear every now and then some. Uh, how can I say? I try to put it in, in a nice way. So I don't really hear half of the compliments. Uh, sorry, half of the complaints about the Teleview products. It just works. It's perfectly uh, works. It's a really good optics. And uh, so for me, having a, a not really good Barlow or a PowerMate is non-existent because I started with a relatively good product. And that's probably what I would recommend to everybody. If it's not uh, Teleview, any, but something trustworthy, definitely. Don't risk because it will determine your final um, result. I'm just going to interject here just for mm -hmm. the people that are watching in regards to this, because I get this all the time, uh, Barlow or, or, or a PowerMate. Uh, PowerMate is just another name for telecentric Barlow, but there is a difference between a Barlow and a telecentric Barlow. When you're imaging, ideally use the telecentric version to always get the PowerMate if you're doing this type of thing. If you're doing eyepieces, just use a regular Barlow. Okay, that's a good advice for me as well. Um, okay, so as we proceed, so this is the, the batting of mask. Um, if you don't have one, uh, if probably there are top three must have accessories, this is one because I I learned over the years. Um, so I'm a, I'm a little bit stubborn and some people suggest me things like when I used to use DSLR for ISS imaging and I had Guy Wells, a really good friend and he kept telling me buy a planetary camera. I said, no, 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 no. I don't need a laptop. I don't need this. I don't need your advice. And after a year later, when I did, I went back to him and said, you remember when you said that? I'm sorry, you were right. <laughs> so if you take my advice, get a batting of mask. I'm kind of mustered more or less how to set accurate focus on a star, but still, it's, it's still there is a chance for error. If you use the batting of mask, you reduce the, the risk of not having sharp focus almost to zero. So that's definitely a must have if you can. So, uh, and what else? Yes, filters. So I tend to use, for both of my cameras, I tend to use filters every now and then. I'm a color international space station imager. So I do know I'm perfectly aware that by not using a mono camera, I'm losing details. They just tend to be better on fine details. And I can see on other people, Martin Lewis, Ralph van der Berg, they're, they're both using, uh, I think, um, mono cameras, and I can see the difference. But but a color shot of the ISS is something, A, it's unique, not many people do it, and B, it's, it looks beautiful, and I love it. So I don't care how much I lose, I like it. But there are certain occasions when I when when I'm in an experimental mood or 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 the weather is just too bad and I wanna and something interesting happens, then I tend to use either a red filter from Zoo ZWO or whoever you can get one or an IR pass filter. I do know the IR cut filters are good as well. I don't have one, and I never really um, seek the advantage to have one. Um, Simon, anything you can probably comment that which one you think might fit better, the pass or the cut from IR? Uh, wait, hold on a second. Are you only trying to let in red light, first of all? Mm -hmm. Then I would probably use an IR pass, not an IR cut. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay. the thing, the big difference here is, is um, when you're imaging the ISS, it does make a big difference to use some type of filter, either a UV or an IR cut filter will help reduce the glow. But why we use the red one specifically is because if you're using a refractor, for example, red tends to perform the best. So if you filter out all the colors, they are less likely to have chromatic aberrations or getting a double image resulting in what looks like a blurred picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in general, as far as I'm concerned, if you're focusing on the red light, that's, that's least pass. affected. But yeah, um, I mean, sorry, a red filter or in the red spectrum is basically uh, that. So that spectrum that least affected by the bad atmospheric conditions. Correct. Yeah, it's it's mm -hmm. that's why you're able to see more things with just the red filter. Incidentally, yep. 
The same phenomenon is also true when we're doing narrowband imaging. It's why hydrogen alpha always looks the best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's how I knew, and that's mainly the, the motive behind behind why I'm using. But only these two filters I'm using, and with the mono camera, I tend to use filters because it always helps to a certain degree, I think. Okay, uh, so these are the filters and let me just see what else. Uh, laser collimator, I know that probably a, a collimator should be, again, uh, a, a, a top, top, top uh, collimator should be a priority. This is some of my gray area. I need to improve a little bit. Um, I can see that it's still sharp, my images, so it's not that bad. But to be honest, I, I, I should seek for perfection in this one because again, it helps. And then basically here, I just summarized uh, what cost and how much. And I have, okay, so this is how I'm tracking the International Space Station. With this animation, you're gonna see that I'm basically behind the telescope. And once I, everything is set and aligned, that, that I'm, just, I'm just moving the telescope. I loosen the two knobs on the side, and then that's it. And I just go for it. I just press the button. I make sure I press the button because that happened as well in the past <laughs> that I thought I pressed the button and I didn't. And I was like, oh, let's see. Oh, there is nothing to see here. <laughs> so that was funny. Also, uh, tricks like that. I'm, I'm, I'm tend to talk about some of my mistakes because I'm, I'm going to help you with this to avoid these mistakes. When I used last time a betting of mask about a month ago and I tried to focus on the star caster and who's not familiar with what Castor is. Castor is, as far as I'm concerned, is a double star, or at least there are two stars right next to each other. And if you try to focus on a double star with a batting of mask, you're not gonna get the same pattern as you do it with a single star. So before I brought out, I banged accidentally at the um, focuser, my telescope, and I thought I screwed up something. And then about, after 10 minutes and, and I was just about to give it up, then I realized that I'm trying to take focus on a double star. So when I slew to a normal star, everything was perfect. So, you know, and I know it sounds silly, but when you are there and you're kind of full, filled with adrenaline before the flyby, you know, sometimes these things can easily <laughs> happen. Um, I recorded one of my uh, sessions and then here, uh, you're going to see exactly how does it look like. So I don't have a garden, so I tend to do some of my observations on the street, which is not ideal, but at some point we're going to get there. So I'm on the street, and this is my equipment. What you see here, that's what I'm taking the photos with. Nothing more, nothing less. I'm sorry, with the laptop. And, uh, and so it's all about collimation and then making sure everything is perfectly aligned. Um, and then I wait for, for, for a star to emerge. And then I start basically um, further making sure that alignment is good. And then uh, I do the focusing. And why I'm showing you this video is basically because I shot some footage about, so this is the Terrod I mentioned. And you're gonna see these are the concentric circles and the resolution is not probably enough, good enough, but somewhere here we see Venus. So this is my sort of my eyes point of view as you look through the tail rod. That's Venus there. Actually, you can see it. That's just there. And this is how it makes so much easier because I don't need to struggle to actually see, um, you know, the, the object through, um, through the tail rod. So this is when I'm, when I'm trying. So it's all manual. Nothing is tracking. You can see uh, the Venus was at the half phase. It was probably a month ago. So you can see sliding out. So I keep pushing it back, you know, and then I'm making sure that I have, have it in the middle of my laptop screen. And then I align the, um, uh, the Terra, that's the batting of mask. So when the batting of mask is inserted, uh, just gonna go quickly forward. Okay, so that's, that's what we should see in the batting of mask, basically. So when you put it on, it, it creates this sort of dif diffraction. Um, so yeah, you can see these spikes. And as you play with the focuser, you will see that the, so you can see an X and then you can see a horizontal line. 
and the horizontal line tends to go up and down and you need to play uh, with the focuser until you get this. This is a little bit overexposed. There are three spikes in here as well. And that's how you set super accurate focus, basically. And then once, once you are there, then you just tighten the screw with the focuser at the focuser and you never touch again uh, till the end of your session, basically. And once again, important taking of the Batinov mask, that's a common error as well because then you wonder why your ISS looks funny. So basically that's because you forgot to take off the Batinov mask in the rush. Um, and then here, obviously, these, these are the moments of where is it? Where is it? It should, it should come off now. It can come any second. And then once, once I see it, I have kind of, if unless I'm practicing, I don't really start imaging below 40 degrees. It's just too far away. It's like seven, 800 kilometers away from your location. So I, I, I wait till it gets to 50, 40, 40, 50 degrees. And then from that moment, I start playing. And then I just put an extra video on the right hand corner because this is what ISS sees from us, basically. This is how it just travels into the night. And these are the moments we are preciously trying to capture, basically. And then here, I got so excited that I just picked up my phone because the ISS was still visible and it was still proceeding and it was still really bright. So this is how bright it is. You know, even my phone easily makes it up. It's just, yeah, just right there, just right there. <laughs> so, and then once the rush is over, I go back to my laptop and, and I use a software called PIPP. And PIPP is a software that when you drag one video in there, it just breaks him down into in every frame into an individual TIFF file. And, and on top of it, it has a, a property that you can on the bottom click, either you do planetary or lunar or solar or whatever you do, there is an ISS function. So with that one, it will focus um, on an, uh, so it would change into an ISS mode. So it means that it will just detect one object. You can set the sensitivity and you can choose if you want it to position on every frame it detects a bright object, it moves it to the center. And that, that makes my life so much easier. Without PIPP, this would be uh, a, a really time consuming hobby. And then what you see here is this is the raw footage. And when I'm playing, when I go back and forth um, uh, with, the, with the keys, you're gonna see it's just, it's, just, it's just going randomly across the screen because when I'm, when I'm actually imaging it, then, then it, just, it just goes. So if, you're, if, if what you see from me, the screen, is the screen that I'm recording, then basically what you are witnessing is if my, if my hand is the ISS, so that's what you see. So it just comes in and goes out. And, every, and, and when I'm accurately tracking it, then it means it comes in, is there a bit, and then moves out. But because I'm taking almost, well, sorry, over a hundred frames per second, you know, a half a second of this motion in my screen gives me around 60 frames. And then I can maximize how many sharp frames I can take. So basically that's the principle of, uh, of, of, of taking these images. And then, uh, uh, so that's about imaging. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions because uh, then I, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, how to see it and where to get your flyby informations from. So yeah, I'll let you know as the questions come in. So for you guys who are watching at home, um, just yeah, stop posting questions. We will go through them and answer them. Obviously, I won't interrupt him if he's in the middle of saying something important. Sure, fair enough. So how to find ISS? So on my website, which is spacestationguys.com, there is a section called guide to find ISS. So when you go there, on the top of the page, you will see this uh, link uh, is just, it's just entertainment. It just shows the live HD camera on the International Space Station, which is pretty cool, cool alone. So one website I'm using is Heavens Above uh, website. Uh, you just go on the website, 
Here on the right hand corner, you specify a location and you just click on ISS and that's it. And I just noticed, by the way, if I go back, that it shows the Crew Dragon already. <laughs> which means, look, it says, which is brilliant for me as well, because now it shows me where is he going to fly across. And I can see from my balcony tomorrow, I'm going to broadcast it, sadly in Hungarian, but I'm going to pop out, I'm going to do the setup, and I hope the weather looks all right, and I'm trying to take a photo of Crew Dragon. But I don't want to digress too much. It's 57 degrees going to be the, the, the top. Um, lovely and it's going to be only 285 kilometers from my location which is about 110 20 miles probably which, which days do you have i'm just looking at uh, what i've this got here for california 27th this is oh, tomorrow oh man you're gonna have the 27th you're gonna actually have oh man i don't have anything he's gonna to fly above me he's gonna fly above oh, me 22 minutes after launch <laughs> it's my big day <laughs> yes so yeah, so back on track, we're gonna talk about it soon. Um, but yeah, so this is one of the websites. And also if you like, if you happen to like um, uh, satellites as well, there's a daily predictions for brighter satellites and it will show you, you can specify the, magne the, mag the minimum brightness and it just shows you from your location, what kind of website, including Starlink satellites and all the, the major ones. I've seen Terra, I've seen, yeah, it's, this one is showing Dragon as well. <laughs> Already. Wow, that's brilliant. Okay, so that's one website. This is the easier one. Probably the more difficult one is um, CalSky. This is, this is, you need to set your, um, to your location again in the intro, and then, and then you can go into it, and then it's not just able to show you the ISS passes, but it can show you super accurately when the International Space Station is going, is going in front of any celestial body, including stars, planets, and the sun and the moon. And also if there are smaller satellites going in front of it. Um, also, you can look up small uh, spacecrafts. Uh, they have some sort of prediction. And you see in here on their front page, if I open this up, it says the time of the passes of the Dragon capsule. So these are perfect um, places if, let's say, uh, today's Tuesday, yesterday, the Japanese HDV-9 cargo spacecraft got to the International Space Station. And before, one day before, so on Sunday, I took a photo of it. And it was brilliant that you could still see the ISS and the HDV flying right above you. So these are the websites you can get the really good information. Probably the third website I'd like to recommend is Spot the Station by NASA, as far as I'm concerned. This is probably the most straightforward and easiest one, because with this one, if it will load, I don't know what's going on, but in the meantime, I open up another one called, are you familiar with this, Simon, ISS Transit Finder? Oh, probably geez, that's what we use. very familiar. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Because <laughs> I know this is very popular as well. It just, you said you hit auto detect, you can specify the date you want to see, the forecast, the radius, how far you're willing to travel, and you just hit calculate, and it will show you any transits. But does it show you planets as well? No, Simon? it's just the sun and the moon only. Okay, so get familiar with CalSky because CalSky shows you Venus. I took Venus daytime photographs of, uh, I will show you in a second. Oh, I got to ask you this. Um, yes. Since you mentioned that. Yes. There was, there was a time where somebody actually faked one of these images. Do you know anything about that? Sadly, I do. <laughs> Sadly, I do. So there was this, okay, there, there's a story behind it. It's basically... Uh, so this guy, I made a promise that I'm not going to name him. He's a German guy. And yeah, well, no, no, him. we don't know. We did, don't need to name him, but I think people yeah, yeah, yeah. don't know who yeah. he is, who we're yeah. talking he about. He was already named and shamed back in the past. So his photo made it to uh, an APOD, an, an astronomy photograph of the day. So he supposed to take an uh, International Space Station Saturn transit. Um, so what he did instead of the real deal, basically, he he captured the ISS as far as I know, and then he chose the best frame 
and then he had a, a, a really nice uh, satin um, uh, photo that he took and then he just pasted it a couple of times and one right in front of the disc of satin. And, and obviously, if you haven't been in this business long enough, there are clues that will give you away. Uh, Damien Peach, Christopher Go, uh, in that time, who else? Um, Stephen Ramsden. They all started sort of coming up with questions. Hold on for a second. Why all the frames are look exactly the same? Because you know, if you've ever done, even from California, if you take some photos of a transit, most of the ISS are differ a little bit because of the atmosphere. They're not going to look all the same, exactly the same, if you if you zoom in. And that's one clue. If you, if anybody, if you are out there going to fake it, whoever watching, do it in the proper way because we're going to find you. <laughs> you know what the funniest thing is is like I've I've seen so many shots now, and that is the first thing I look for is is that thing for real. And mm -hmm. it's funny because I mm -hmm. originally. Um, I don't think you have this shot, but I did get an A-pod for this as well, is my transit during the solar eclipse. Okay, which um, is pretty niche. So that was something unique, but you see, that's the thing, is somebody said it was fake because it was too well planned, that it just <laughs> skimmed the top of the moon. Um, I will actually show you uh, this, this stuff later on when we do the processing side of things, mm -hmm. because obviously that's what I'm doing, and you'll know that this is not fake but i did get accused of being of creating a fake yeah i mean flat earthers are you know my my usual guests you can imagine that oh, it's fake it's a balloon it's this and that and you know i have now tons of evidence it's, it's not even just my photograph because my website is not just about my photographs it's about giving out the knowledge a and b um what you contributed your photograph to the guest photos you know i happened to create the best ISS hub probably in the world. I mean, the photos are up already there. It's just, it completely blows one mind, you know, that how many talented people are out there pursuing the same hobby and just, I think most of the people have really no knowledge of how much planning and work and practice and thinking goes into a project like that, especially your solar transit project because tiny tiny differences nuances and and it all goes to the bin um oh, real quick so i do have a question here online uh what's the yes, lowest please. magnification lens you um you could feasibly image the iss with Ooh, that's a good one um in other words at what point does mm -hmm. it is it apparent that you can actually see what it is it so is it 300 yeah. millimeters, you know, 200 millimeters, et cetera, et cetera? Yep, yep. I've seen photographs, I think, I think the lowest I've seen where you can make up the ISS is, I think, 600 millimeter. 600 millimeter, but let me say this. I have, I have a 72-420 ED Skywatcher telescope. And with that one, with a planetary camera, um, which altogether still cost way much less than a 600 millimeter, millimeter lens for a camera. <laughs> so with that one, you can easily make it up, easily. So you can what see you're, the panels. So 600 millimeters to you is probably the bare minimum to see anything. Yeah, but again, if you talk about just camera and lens, but, right, yeah, but, yeah. That's, but purposefully I went down to the telescope way because with the telescope to get you know, really good images, you can keep the cost really low down. I mean, okay, so if I add up 11, 1100 uh, pounds, that would probably buy me a secondhand Sony Alpha or a Maybe. really, really secondhand 5D or 6D, <laughs> a really, really secondhand. And, and, and that's it. That's all you have compared to having a planetary camera, which is a high frame rate camera and a relatively beautiful and nice crisp um, telescope. And then you can do way much more, way much more than that. So just for you guys um, out there, the average price of a Tamron 150 to 600 F6.3, you're looking at around about a thousand bucks new. 
used market maybe 550 us dollars uh please don't call me i don't have any i only have new ones uh just <laughs> just before anybody asks me <laughs> and to be fair if i can recommend i know i i sort of upscaled my 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 um equipment it's a it's kind of low mid-size telescope a 10 inch dobsonian but i had the 127 maxitov and i'm telling you that i'm in love with that scope even though i don't have it anymore it's it doesn't require maintenance it's pin sharp you've got the focal length and i will show you if i go back to my website i show you just very quickly one set of images and that one so this one was taken okay guess what a 90 millimeter maxitov telescope and an and an asi 120 mc camera so we're talking about a price of probably 300 pounds so that's about 430 bucks for most people then yeah yeah something like that on an eq1 mount right <laughs> so so you know and look at this i mean look at the details and and that scope has a, a, a 1250 so 1250 millimeter focal length okay you know, sorry so. um here's this is not a question somebody wrote but i know someone's going to ask this now mm -hmm. can you actually track this by hand with a one let's just say you have a 600 millimeter lens can mm -hmm. I track this by hand still? Yep, yep, yep. You either just put it against something, you just put it on a wall, on a fence or something, and then you just move it, or you just put it on a tripod. But make sure you can tilt it. It depends on what flyby you are choosing. If you're choosing you know, a maximum elevation of 70, 60, 70 degrees, then obviously you don't need to aim that high because the trouble always comes when it goes through the zenith because that's when you 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 become in an you know in an awkward end up in an awkward position and that's the hardest because that's when it's the closest and that's when it's the fastest so is so definitely for newbies don't ever start with high flybys because i do know i've seen this before that a lot of people are put off saying oh it's too difficult no it's not um once the air traffic goes back to normal because of the COVID-19 situation. But once it goes back, um, a perfect way to practice is on aircrafts, is the same principle. You need to align your scope with your, um, with your finder scope, and then, and then just is the same motion. You're just tracking something in the sky. It's the same principle, and, and it's a perfect way. And it's daytime, so you see what you're doing. So it's a really nice way to start and sort of getting used to the whole, the whole thing. One more thing for the um, forecast to finish this. Um, this is spot the station from NASA, spotthestation.nasa.gov, but it's all on my website. So, uh, you know, if you forget, uh, you can always find it there. You just click on the map, which is London for me, and then you will see the reason why I like this website, because, and I don't know why it's so slow, probably too many people are looking at it. So it starts with the International Space Station forecasts, and as, as I scroll down, you see the Cygnus spacecraft is still up there. So you can see the Cygnus fly uh, flybys. It's, it, just, it doesn't specify more. You can just see that probably just showing the max elevation, how long it lasts, and roughly what time is it due, basically. And then the HTV flyby uh, setting. So basically, it's not just for ISS, but if there are some, some cargo spacecraft or soon hopefully we're going to have human spacecraft as well fingers crossed then uh, they're going to be all up here um hopefully although with the humans they cut it down to i think six hours with the soyuz and i think it's going to be probably in the future half day or probably hours for the um for the uh crew dragon as well to get to the space station because they try not to make the sp uh, the astronauts trapped in there for too long basically a couple of uh, stories if it fits because i have some some good captures and there are some stories with it that sort of fits onto how minuscule distance uh, sorry differences uh, certain things can make so so you are seeing this right perfect 
So, okay, so I happen to be, um, again, so far, I'm not 100% sure, but as far as I know so far, I'm the only person on this planet who managed to take a shot of the uh, SpaceX Crew Dragon Demo-1 um, mission docked to the International Space Station. I went up for two nights. So these are the photos of, uh, of the launch, but it's so, it's so relevant, it could be happening today, <laughs> basically, because we are seeing the same photographs of the DM-2, the Demo-2 mission. And uh, they had a little, um, I think it's called Ripley, uh, a mannequin. And then there was the launch and I watched it and I, was, and I had some really good flybys and I went out for two nights. And on the first night, uh, the scene wasn't too nice. I marked the Canadarm because it, it's, 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 I'm gonna come back to this, but this is the view from the Crew Dragon as they were approaching the International Space Station. Again, this is something we're gonna see hopefully tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. So it's, it's really interesting that we are talking about this this, this topic. This is just about birth. This is how the Crew Dragon looks. And this is me again imaging. This was the first night. You can see the amount of clouds. So there is no wonder the first night uh, was just a semi sort of success, but I could locate um, the International Space Station. Um, so this is the Crew Dragon. And if I, can I pause it? Yes. If I move my head a bit, there's the International Space Station behind me. And this is the Harmony module, basically in between the Japanese keyboard module and the European uh, Columbus module. So what you're gonna see, um, so what happened in real life and what we're gonna see tomorrow or the day after tomorrow is that, so if this is the International Space Station, this is the Earth, uh, the Crew Dragon is not approaching the space station from below but instead it's coming from the side because it's gonna be docked to the aft uh, docking port of the Harmony module. And so if I play this, this is, you can see the air, this is the UK atmosphere in general. It's very uh, wobbly, but I made this little um, animation where I just play the same amount, same seven frames all over again. So this is the Crew Dragon module and this is the Canadarm I pointed out on the air, on their approach. So you can see this, this is just a render. This is what it looks like. You can see on one side, there are some solar panels and this is a still image and that's the Crew Dragon, basically. You can see the trunk section um, from that tiny little um, spacecraft and hopefully soon, you're gonna see it again, taking uh, Bob Banken and Doc Hurley to the International Space Station. So this is again the still image and I just helped, I just put some uh, representation. So this is the trunk section and we see the trunk section mainly. It's all about shading, you know, because uh, the lights play funny on the International Space Station, especially close to uh, going into shadow. Uh, so that's why we can only see the trunk. And later on, I knew when I looked back, some of the HD um, cameras, actually, I could spot the Canadarm as well. This is me um, with my equipment uh, out and about. And that's when they came back. My other, this is probably one of, one of my most interesting one. So I think last September, last July, I'm sorry, the Soyuz MS-13 spacecraft was heading into the International Space Station. And this is the actual image that we took. So what you see here, this is the International Space Station, and this is the Soyuz spacecraft, only 76 meters away. The only reason why I know this, because when I spotted the International Space Station, just before I started imaging, I started recording on my phone the live coverage of, of the docking. And they show sometimes some, uh, some details on the external camera of the Soyuz. And I knew exactly when they were above me, when I took the photos, I, I knew exactly what was the distance. So you need to know that, that that Soyuz spacecraft was launched six hours before this actual photo was taken. I've seen them 92 minutes before this photo was taken. They were 
they were lower, but I could see the ISS and the tiny Soyuz following it, a little bit fainter. And if they are, for some reason, they need to hold back, or they they always they, they tend to get there a little bit earlier every now and then. So if if they are already docked, there was nothing to see. But myself, Martin Lewis, and uh, Nicolas Jonu, we all photographed the same event. So I took two, I have two good photographs. This one less colorful. Here you can see, that's why I like the color images of the International Space Station, because the, the, the panel just looks stunning. But on this one, there are no panels because we see them like this instead of this position. And then I made, this footage. So these are the best frames and I try to sort of correct them and align them, but the shimmering, uh, the atmospheric sort of effect, I can't take it out. And uh, yeah, so you can see the white, tiny little solar panels of that uh, Soyuz spacecraft. And that's unique because that doesn't happen too much. That's the Zvezda module and it's just docked from the aft module. And of course, this played a crucial role because if they were about to dock to the Pierce or the Rasvet module modules, then at this time, 10 minutes prior to docking, instead of them being here and approaching from the side, they were somewhere around here. So they, they are just a dot somewhere or they are just blending into the structure of the space station. But luckily that's not what happened for my uh, biggest joy. And this is the external camera of the Soyuz and it says clearly 0 0.076 kilometers. So that's 76 meters away. This was the equipment again. And uh, finally, the last um, crew, uh, sorry, um, cargo dragon spacecraft. And you can see this is why I love animation. And this is why I urge everybody to go for high frame rate cameras because you are maximizing your chance to capture as much as many sharp frames as possible because one photo sometimes doesn't do the justice sometimes you cannot actually make out what's happening on on a photo but if you have an animation things just just tend to come alive you can i i photographed on a low pass um spacecraft that's that's docked to the far side of the international. So we see this is the nadir side, nadir side, and I captured the one that's on the zenith side, just because an animation revealed it. From a photo, I would never, uh, I, I could never find out that what was going on. So there are some other photographs, mine and other people's photos, again, about the, uh, the, the uh, cargo dragon spacecraft. Uh, again, this is Philip Smith's, um, uh, crazy crazy shot i mean just look at this this is this is this was taken with the c14 from america his name is philip smith if you don't know him get familiar with his work this is what he does on the right hand side again it's a mind-blowing moment so this is crs 16 i talked to you about this before this is a solar transit and this is about three hours prior to docking and when I played back the video, I couldn't see anything. So I had to process the hell out of it to actually make that tiny, tiny, tiny little dot just right there following the International Space Station. But obviously it was with a small 127 Maxitov. So um, that's the max I could basically get out of it. And again, this is, uh, this is flying solo, a Dragon spacecraft. Um, again, there are some details on it with a 10 inch telescope. This is just, just unearthly, you know, it's so hard to comprehend that we're talking about an object traveling at almost 17, 18,000 miles per hour at around three, four, 500 kilometers or so two, 300 miles above the surface. So it's, yeah, it's, it's hard to comprehend. This, this is so-called high beta angle. So you wonder where, are, where the other two solar panels have gone. <laughs> what happened to them? Well, the wind didn't blow it away. Um, instead, they are in a high beta angle. So in this, during this month, Dave Dickinson writes a really good article on, on the universe today about this phenomena. 
So during these times, uh, it's about a month, the ISS is constantly lit by the internet. Um, sorry, the, the ISS is constantly lit by the by the sun. So the Earth never comes it being in between the ISS and the, the sun. So they have some thermal management problems. So they need to turn two of from the four panels away. And I think they also with the radiators and they try to cause some sort of shadow. And this is how they try to reduce um, the heat building up on the International Space Station. And what I mentioned to you, I'm going to close this and I go back to your gallery and I would like to particularly show you that Venus transit um, because that's what, that's, that's what I got from CalSky. And otherwise I wouldn't have uh, got that forecast. So this is, so that's Venus. It was, uh, you can see by the phase that it was around, I think, 80% illuminated. And this is a daytime. So it was, the sun was up about two hours already. So we are two hours past sunrise. So the sun was relatively high. And then these are the best frames. You can, you can see quite some details on the, on the space station as it was passed. My idea was to, to do a transit in front of the Venus, but I couldn't find the spot where I could set up um, my equipment. And this is how much on the blue sky, this is how much detail you can get in prime focus. Um, I think this was taken with a one, 120mm camera. So yeah, yeah, this is, this is pretty much what can be done. So sun was, the sun was 23 degrees above the horizon. So it was pretty, pretty, pretty high up, I have to say. And if I have to choose one more thing, I would like to show you my best lunar transit. This is probably something I'm the most proud of. So this is the transit itself. Uh, almost everything was perfect. So this is the perfect scenario for me because the moon was contrasty. Uh, I purposefully did not set up on the center line. My idea was not to touch at all the moon, but I was a little bit within that path by the edge. So it touched a bit, but probably came out really nice. And so when you, my message is that once you are into a subject, it, it takes you on a route that, that you wouldn't ever guessed before. And what I was, so I've seen Christopher Becky's uh, photo on Twitter and he had a transit and cleverly what he did, every single frame of this transit, you crop it around. And then what you're gonna see is this. So you change the whole perspective of the whole transit. So instead of the moon is fixed and the ISS is moving, you on every frame, that's visible in that path in your field of view, you crop around the ISS, the same size rectangular, and basically the ISS is fixed and the moon is in motion. Basically, it's like, and obviously I got questions on YouTube and here and there that this is impossible. You cannot track the ISS this accurately. And I, and I usually say, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. I cannot track it this accurately, but you, there are ways and creativity. You can come around and create something totally new, totally um, honestly. And obviously for you, this is especially something really nice, Simon, because you are a transit expert. So you can create these kind of animations. It's a hell of a work, but... You know what, I've actually tried to do something like this with the sun, uh, because I shoot in white light, it never, it's never apparent what's really happening unless there was a um, something going on on the sun, like a sunspot or something. Yep, yep, yep. Um, probably it's more more useful on, on lunar transits. Oh, definitely. Because you, it has a surface um, and probably with H alpha uh, photos. But to be fair, I think with the sun as well, if you, if, if you separate the files and in, in Photoshop, you just paste one onto another, you already reduce to this size 
and then you just paste the other one and just just align the because the ISS is your reference point from one frame to another. So if if the ISS are overlapping each other, you're fine. And then whatever the com come out will be, I would definitely urge you to try that. Oh, believe you me, I've, I've, I've already got plans to start shooting <laughs> stuff like this already. <laughs> nice, nice. So so roughly that would be my presentation. Um, yeah, yeah. Probably just one more thing that I mentioned, the 127 uh, scope. So with an ASI camera, this is what, what you would see from the moon. And so imagine this, I wanted to capture the International Space Station with this small scope, with this camera um, going in front of the moon. And then guess what? Like three minutes prior to the transit, this happened. <laughs> so this is a United flight, a high altitude flight, bang on. And this is the ISS. So this is how the ISS looks. Um, I can't find, find toggle, but this you know is what, how look, it went. Yeah. I was going to say, you know what could, would have been really funny if, if it happened back to back? No, that's in my dreams only. <laughs> 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 so that's the United Airlines. So I was already, you know, preparing a couple of minutes. And because I do these kind of transits as well, I saw it's coming and, oh, it's getting closer. Oh, hold on for a second. And it's bang on. And then that's the ISS. So this is how big the ISS could be. And then what I did, I merged the two because it, it was taken right after each other with the same equipment, with the same settings. So I can sort of put it into perspective that how large the ISS. So the ISS was 40.4, sorry, 44.3 arc secs. So that's around how large Jupiter looks at the moment, I think. So tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, and then this is the flight. And then you will see on the right hand corner. So that's, so if I, if I'm, then I merge the two and then you will see how big, this is the apparent size. So this is how large the ISS compared to a high flying um, aircraft. So it's about roughly the diameter of one of the engine. And, but you, but you need to know that the largest, I think, the ISS can appear is just over one arc minute. So 60, one, two, three arc seconds. So probably at its best when it's in the zenith, then it's slightly bigger than the diameter of that uh, jet engine. So yeah, so it just puts everything into perspective that how to imagine that how large or how tiny the International Space Station is in the sky. Sorry, yeah, I'm really done. <laughs> I can't hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? Brilliant. Hello? Hello? Yep, yeah, I can okay, hear good. you. Okay, so I'm sure there's going to be so many questions um, in, in just a moment, and I'm going to start with the blatantly obvious ones that okay. everybody will always ask. What exactly are the settings that you're using for most of your flybys, not transits, but flybys based mm -hmm. upon its magnitude? So let's just assume that you know ahead of time it's a negative three magnitude. Mm -hmm. What is your shutter speed um, mm -hmm. set to? What is your exposure, um, so forth and so on, the gain, gotcha. all of that? Th they're gotcha. questions people are going to just bombard me with it. So I might as well ask you now. Okay, that's a very fair question. So before I hit that, everybody, I urge you to get, um, it's called ISS Detector. That's an app. And the reason why I'm so highlighting this, it's on the how to find ISS on the webpage, on my webpage. But the reason why I emphasize this, I'm gonna show you like this. It's not the best way, but I show you like this. Oh, hold on. So, just, uh, I'm just gonna full screen you so people can actually okay. see that. Hold on. Okay, there we go. Okay, so it's ISS detector and probably it's mirror, but uh, uh, so the main point I'm trying to raise here, can you see that eyeball in the middle section, in the middle column? Yep. There are certain size of eyeballs. 
and then the eyeballs are meant to represent the all over the all over uh, illumination of the International Space Station. So when it's smaller, like here, then it means that the main structure will be mainly visible, and then the rest probably not. So the reason why I, I, I urge you to have this app, because it doesn't just tell you when the next flyby is, but it shows you how bright it's going to be and the overall illumination of the space station. So if you start imaging, I know we, we not always have the novelty of choosing the best of the best transits, but when you are practicing and when you're trying to find out your settings, try to aim for similar magnitude. So the let's, let's say the brightest uh, possible um, passes and, and also the little eyeballs. That's super important because if you're gonna aim for let's say the ones when the eyeball is mid-size or small, then you're gonna go wonder, oh, why I can't see the solar panels? Why I can't see certain bits? It's because <clears throat> there is a reason for it. How, what's the elevation? What's the, so how, how much, how, how, much so how low the sun is below the horizon? Um, what's the position, the orientation of the space station? What seasons are we are? So on and so forth. So the settings, um, what I always say, <clears throat> I'm going to say and not say things. So with the expo, I can say with a 100% confidence that my, my, I have a golden rule. That's my one millisecond golden rule. You never go over one millisecond. If you're not going over one millisecond, you can't go wrong with that. Because um, I don't know what exactly the line of, you know, when you are uh, underexposing a bright object, they st start sort of like a chewing gum. They're not one fixed sharp object, but they are washed away and they sort of elongated. And that's why this principle is coming from. So if you set one millisecond or less, then you kind of, you already eliminated one of the key factors. The game or ISO is something that I don't really go into usually, because it, it depends on a gajillion things. It depends on, you know, what kind of scope you are using. Even if you are using the same scope like me, it depends on what kind of focal extender, what kind of camera you are using. <clears throat> so my sort of golden rule is with that, find the brightest stars, one of them, Vega, Arcturus, uh, you name it, any of the Castor, um, but don't set the betting of mask on Castor. Um, and uh, so find any of those. And once you have your working uh, set, what you're gonna use for the, for the um, imaging, then find these, one of these stars, and this star shouldn't be like shining really bright. It should be kind of not too faint, it's just visible. You can see it's a star, but you can't see those shimmering. So lower your gain or ISO that much. And then you kind of, that's a good starting point. And then from now, from that point, so there is no clear recipe that you set this and this and you're going to be all right. So here's a, here's a really good tip for the people that are watching uh, this is how to figure out what your exposure for the ISS is. And I only just learned this recently. If you know the apparent magnitude of the ISS, look at the moon and then look at what the apparent magnitude brightness is. And you can actually expose for the moon, depending on the bright brightness, and then go accordingly from that if you're trying to get that spot on focus. Because remember, magnitude brightness is still the same regardless of what the object is, regardless how big mm -hmm. or small it is. Mm -hmm. That gives you your exposure. So what you can do is ahead of time, um, although somebody said to me, don't do this during a full moon, which kind of makes sense, is to use a, a crescent moon and you pick the corner of the crescent. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm just going to just make this so you guys can see what I'm doing. So imagine the crescent is this. You are looking in these corners. You're not looking up here, down there, in the middle. You're waiting for that crescent and you're picking out these corners. And the idea here is to expose for those corners and what you'll find here is you'll actually get a pretty good exposure of the ISS. Yes. Yes, I totally agree with that. The only reason why I stopped using setting either focus or correct 
camera settings on any celestial object apart from stars because they just not around all the time, especially planets. And if the planets are low, it's going to mislead you that you are setting the wrong focus for the ISS. So for flybys, um, I would urge everybody to forget uh, the moon or the planets and aim for the stars because that's your that's that's what's going to be around all the time. The moon is, again, if it's around, then it's handy. But if it's not around, you're going to stand there and like, oh, why am I going to do, you know, we don't have the moon. But if you have your backup plan, i.e. the stars, then you can just anytime, you just go and aim for a star and then and set things. But, but to be honest, the settings for your, for your equipment needs to determine once. Right. And that's it. That's it. Once you know your settings, I'm not experimenting with that. Once yeah, I that's... figured it out, you just set it up, off to go. So the next thing here is focus. Uh, I know you touched mm -hmm. on it, batten off mass, the whole nine yards, but here's the interesting thing. Depending on the speed of your scope, mm -hmm. uh, some people have an F11, some people might have F7, uh, F4, or so forth and so on, which is basically an indication of depth of field is what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. we know that the ISS is closer than that star. So setting infinity focus mm -hmm. for that star may not actually be the correct focus. Is that true or is that false? Because I get this conflicted conversation with people who tell me different things. Right. Um, what I can say about that, that uh, I definitely wouldn't call myself a technical person, definitely not the ones who are crunching numbers and you know, like pixel size and and sort of things like that. I'm I'm a practical person, so I try things, and if it works, I do it. If it doesn't work, I ditch it. And so far, when I whenever I set the focus on a star with the batting of mask, all my photos were taken that way. Everybody can decide if it's sharp enough or not. I think it's sharp enough because I can see that when I catch some of those less turbulent moments, it's pin sharp. So, or as sharp as it can get with a, with a fast moving object. So I don't think that the, that the make of a scope would make much difference. Probably how your end result is gonna look, probably there it does make a difference. But by setting the focus, I don't think that it, it plays any kind of role that what kind of scope you're using. That's my, my Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, I get a lot of some of these people with, with the overly technical aspect because it is true, mm -hmm. focusing for the star and focusing for the moon are two different things mm -hmm. because they are ever so slightly apart. Yeah. Um, I mean, the idea behind it, I guess, is at the end of the day is just experiment, just test it out yourself and then see how you go from there. Um, Precisely. Aperture, 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 and more aperture how much of a critical difference does it really make? And I, I know the answer to this. I want to hear it from you. The, you mean the focal length or the, the, focal diameter, length, the, the size diameter? Of, the size of the telescope. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so since astronomy, I always, and I'm a small person, so I always emphasize that the size is not everything, usually. <laughs> but in this game, it is. <laughs> Hugely. So... I showed you the photos of that transit with my uh, 90 millimeter Maxutov. And so I was the happiest person on this planet walking alive when I took that photo with that tiny uh, scope. But if you really want details, you cannot escape the fact that you have to upsize your equipment. That's just how it works. You know, an eight, an 8 inch Newtonian is a sufficient size to do that. And the, the purpose why I is just down there, that's my Dobsonian telescope, by the way. And the reason why I went for that is because it's a flex tube, it's collapsible. So having a 10 inch, you, you Simon has a 10 inch uh, regular, and that's, that's, that's tall. That's like a person, that's tall almost, you know. And for me, to keep it, you know, this is so much easier. Yeah, I make a compromise with the collimation, but this is, I would say, 
the real series entry. 8 or 10 inch is the series entry level. Obviously, any of the SCTs, even a, a six, 6 inch next star mm -hmm. um, would do brilliant shots. But, but catadioptrix, so SCTs, Mexutovs are a different kettle of fish completely. Um, now, you track by hand, um, which obviously you've gone through in quite extensive details. What if I use a hand controller? Didn't work for me. Uh, the, the, so the real trouble with the ISS is, is so how the speed it, 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 it goes and flies above you, it's constantly changing. Until it reaches its maximum, let's say we having a, a zenith pass, so it, it, it crossed right above you 90 degrees. So till the point it reaches 90 degrees, it's keep accelerating in the sky. So the amount of distance it covers in the sky is increasing till that point. So if you set your head controller to, I just say something five, and then you think at that moment, it kind of covers the ground, you will see you start losing it. Then you need to press number two and then you change seven and then you try to catch up, but you need to set a, a faster speed because, because you need to catch up with that. But then once you caught up with that, you realize that speed is too much. And then you just wait and then press, wait and press. So it didn't work for me. We all need that kind of gadget, you know, from back to the future when, when Doc had that big controller and one is just the direction and the other one is the slew speed. But none of the makers feel this important. Some DIY guys came up with an idea, but you know, it would be so amazing that if it, you know, if if that might work. But with the regular hand controller, everybody feel free to try. It didn't work for me, sadly, for the aforementioned reasons. So uh, for those guys who are interested and you currently own um, one of these mounts. Uh, Software Bisque makes obviously the Paramounts. They have the MX Plus, uh, they have the Mighty, as far as I can remember, that can do this. They have all of their mounts, put it that way. With the SkyX software, you can actually track a satellite with it in real time, regardless of its speed. So if you guys own a, uh, a Bisque mount with the SkyX, I so implore you to give that a try if you haven't already done it before. And I probably did just started something because now everyone's going to want to do it. <laughs> but you can totally do it with uh, an electronic tracking platform, but you need to have the right equipment. That is definitely on my list to have that because that's an experience I have never witnessed. When oh, you have the comfort dude, of just if, sitting there and you can set the camera settings and you just see it happening. If you ever make it here to the US um, and you come for one of these shows, it's called the Advanced Imaging Conference. Um, it's every two years, always happens in San Jose. The next one is well, not this year, but the next year. Um, there's two companies out there, Plane Wave and Software Bisc. Both of them mm -hmm. have a demo and a video of them doing just that, tracking satellites. Mm -hmm. That's all they do. And mm -hmm. it is just unreal how good it is. And it, mm -hmm. these guys have like a 16 inch CDK and it's like, it's just <laughs> like, no, no problem. Can I just interrupt? Because sure. I forgot to mention one of the, one of the problem recent and most, um, not controversial, but um, it's an interesting catch because I forgot to mention What's going to happen tomorrow, and probably we're going to cover that topic in a second, uh, the same thing happened on the 22nd of April, but instead of having a Falcon uh, 9 upper stage and the Crew Dragon, uh, the payload was 60 Starlight satellites, uh, Starlink satellites. Oh, and you were I, going to show me this. That's right. And I happened to capture this footage. So on this footage, this is the second stage. And these are the 60 satellites. So we are seven minutes after deployment and nobody seen and nobody knew what's happening in, in, in those minutes because they don't cover it in the live coverage because, because they have some sort of patented, patented 
way of how they deploy its rotates and it's sort of like a uh, pack of cards it's in its unfolds that's how they describe it so a couple of us came together and we took this shot and look at this so it was further away the two the double chain became one because of the angle change but then this appeared so this is the falcon 9 upper stage this is how it looks and this is on my photograph and so this is how hopefully i'm going to see it tomorrow the only difference is that at this shot i think the max altitude was 84 degrees um, but this wasn't taken when it was the highest so it was already coming down so probably it was taken around the alti the altitude um, sorry elevation in the sky like what the tomorrow maximum elevation flyby is going to be so what i'm exact expecting so if this big the second stage is going to be the crew dragon is about is about the size of the the whole um, section without the actual um, nozzle. So I'm expecting, uh, so because this camera, uh, so my scope with this setting can easily cover this. Th this is my full field of view. I can easily fit it in there. And I hope that I can and catch as many frames as possible. And then I can create an animation of them sort of changing the angle, the orientation as they get further and further away. But the by, but by the time we figured out that what we can see, so here, look, we marked, we marked all the 60 satellites because we, we thought these are extra satellites broke away from the chain. But as you can see, you know, I started sort of numbering them 30 here, 60 there. So all the 60 is in there. So we didn't know what that is because I assume this is the second stage, this tiny little bit. Well, actually this was, and I show you something that I hope is going to blow your mind. That's Martin Lewis's um, animation. So this is the double chain. And look, this is the so-called mysterious object. We didn't know what that was. And we assume that the bright bits are just satellites. And then just this was just an extra payload that wasn't official. And then we started digging in and look at this. So we figured out that so this is, you can see there's a motion like this. Something is turning. And what we see here is basically, this is the second stage. This bit is this highly reflective covering just behind the nozzle and the main body of the, of the second stage. So what we see here is that the second stage nozzle is facing towards us because the second stage from this position it needs to turn around 180 to be able to do a deorbit burn because the second, day, second stage doesn't do a full orbit. It comes down before it goes around and fly above you guys. So that's it's kind of said that you guys from America, you cannot photograph the second stage. No, because I know, because that's, that's the problem. Where we launch from, by the time it gets up into the air, it's prime for you. Yes, but as again, once it's launched from Florida, it re-enters and burns above Australia. So it doesn't go one revolution around the Earth. And what we see here is as it's turning around to begin to, to prepare itself uh, for the deorbit burn, because the nozzle, the, 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 the Merlin engine, needs to face against the travel of direction and they can slow itself down. And this bit is basically, so you're gonna see, so the bright bit is here, the cover, the highly reflective cover. This is, you can tiny bit seeing the, you can see the nozzle and this bit up here is this part, just a reflection. And you know what? It took me a week to figure out what exactly we see. And I can tell you if there is no animation if it's just, uh, where was it? If it's just this kind of photograph, it's still a mystery. I wouldn't have be, I wouldn't be able to solve it if it's just one still image. But because Martin um, took this brilliant, you see the top bit disappears. 
because the top bit so as you see it this is the top bit and it just turns it's just you know it's just when i when i realized this and then there was this sort of light bulb moment i was like no way and i have never seen anybody taking a footage of this kind of thing ever so and this is just for the final moment this is again an animation you see from the double chain still available a bit and then it just changes and and look there is a flare just between the nozzle somewhere where the highly reflective bit is there there's a tiny flare but I'm not too sure if those are the cold thrusters as it turns around or it's just a flare um, from the high reflective cover. But I, I've made a promise to myself that I'm not going into any more assumption because I already misled so many people with this. I kept calling it a mysterious object and it turns out it's the bloody second stage. <laughs> yeah, I know you don't want to start anything from the alien conspiracies. That's that's for no, no, sure. no, 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 definitely not. <laughs> so, um, your pass. So you got the launch on the twenty seventh, obviously. Yes. W your pass that occurs for you. What part of the stage do you think you're going to see? Are you going to see the approach of the ISS, or are you going to catch the launch and then something else the following day? Um, so, okay, so my my only option is basically if I go back to the to the heavens above uh, prediction, then I will show you that my one and only okay. So I have one flyby. So in our time, the fly so the launch gonna be at nine thirty three, most likely. So. Um, we should see 20 minutes after. So with Starlink and they are traveling with the same speed, the same rule applies, I, as far as I know, they should be 20 minutes later, they fly by. Then one uh, revolution later, I'm gonna have a flyby, but it only goes 11 degrees. And then my next flyby is in the next evening, but because they are my time, According to my time, uh, they're going to be docking on Thursday early afternoon. Yeah, that's so, what I got as well was mm -hmm. Thursday afternoon. Yeah. So my one and only option is right after the launch. 57 degrees is something. So I'm going to do a live coverage for Hungarians and I'm going to do the setup on my balcony and I'm going to just pop out from the live event um, like like roughly 13 minutes after launch <laughs> and and I just go out do the final checks I will waiting there and then I'm gonna drag my laptop in we're gonna continue uh, the Hungarian sort of webcast and and then hopefully I'm gonna share my my, my photos there if there is any hopefully right. but pff, it's a big thing especially I'm having the demo one photograph you know, I desperately want to nail it. And we are just ending the ISS flybys from UK. So for the next three weeks, we only going to have transits, best case scenario. So no, right. no, no real flybys. Uh, yeah. So um, sky. even for us, the only one that I have is May 30th, not May 31st, uh, May, uh, June 1st is the only one that I have an 83 degree. The day mm -hmm. of launch is 23 degrees i mean i'm that's i'm pushing it at 23 degrees mm -hmm. yeah. right 23 degrees hopefully you can you so do you know how 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 much prior to the docking is it going to be uh i i, I actually have the time uh on the 27th the highest point is at 22, 45, and 57. I don't know if this is set universal time or not. It should have been, yeah, it's universal time. It's seven hours ahead, according to this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. I, so you I, definitely should go for it on the 27th when you have the high pass. I don't even have a high pass. 23 degrees is the highest it gets. That's the highest. Yeah, okay. So, sorry, I misunderstood you for a second. So then basically, you know, these are the situations when you just go for whatever you can. 
because because to be fair you you i mean it's it's not gonna be good 23 degrees is too far away it's 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 like over a thousand kilometers away or even more um, right but at least you're gonna see the two objects you know and that's that's if you take a long exposure shot let's say um because with telescope i mean try it i mean you can do parallel things but what i definitely would do if i were you is definitely just aim towards that part of the sky and, and do the DSLR because they're not going to be on the same path. So you're going to see one long trail and then below that a fainter uh, trail on the similar path because there's definitely something that's, that's, that, that, that I would do and probably will do with a camera as well outside. Yeah, as the only not. thing I seem to have um, that works in my advantage is a transit um let me yep from map that might be awesome so we're going to select it from here mm -hmm. uh what's the date what was it again these 27th right yes 27th. 27th yep yeah i have a two star it's not going to mm -hmm. be a fantastic one it's only a two star pass mm-hmm so let's uh, what's recap. the elevation of and what front what in front of what so let's the sun everybody. sun okay and yeah. what's the elevation of the sun uh, 27 degrees <laughs> okay. oh, man. it seems this like is... you are destined to this 20 between 20 and 30 values <laughs> yeah <laughs> for the, yeah it's not again because it's launching from ow, it's because it's launching from florida it's yes. not in my favor at mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's three stars is the best I'm going to get it at with a 1.34 total transit time. Okay. Uh, okay. I do have the 28th on the other mm -hmm. hand, which then mm -hmm. it would have already docked, of course. Um, the 28th recalculates. If it's a high pass transit and you think that the weather it will cooperate the way that you can make out good details, I think you can you can point out the the crew dragon probably um i mean obviously the crew dragon's going to be up there for quite some significant time so yep i've yep. got plenty of four star passes from a transit standpoint that i can look at it but i'd love to be able to get a uh, a clean shot that isn't a transit so it's like mm -hmm. a direct shot that would be something i would want to get that mm -hmm. might have to wait until a little bit later on in the month mm -hmm. um or beginning of uh june so yep. it is what yep. it is Yep, yep, yep. And then and then probably this is the perfect example that how um, we are just passengers in these situations. And that yeah. is probably that 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 puts again lots of people off. Because it's not it's not to, up to you. Even if you do everything spot on, you prepare, you are there, you're standing there. You know how many times it happened to me? I went out, clear sky, mm -hmm. and then 20 minutes prior to setting, it's like somebody says, he's out, he's out, he's out, clouds, clouds, clouds. And then the flyby goes off and I'm like, rah, 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 rah. and then I'm packing in. Mm -hmm. And by the time I pick up the last piece, it's completely clear again. Yeah, of course. And you just, and, and I'm just like, what, why am I doing this? Why did I choose this hobby? Why am I torturing myself? There but are you, better ways to torture yourself. Well, yes. <laughs> but you know, the funny thing here is, though, is this is actually one of these things we can actually do where even if there are clouds, it's not the end of the world. As no. long as you still see the streak, you will see it even through the clouds yeah. because we're imaging at such a high frame rate, it mm -hmm. almost doesn't matter any longer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If there is nothing super interesting going out then i understand that you know i'm i'm not too keen anymore on going whatever um circumstances if i'm just just taking photos of uh, of the iss then i choose my my times especially these this time of the year because here is just so unsocial it's like one o'clock at night or right. three o'clock at night you know who want to wake up at that time but in the same time when something happens you know all the practice that I've done during that couple of years, you always benefit. Plus, when you make your mistakes, that's the best way, sadly, to learn from it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I always said there are no bad mistakes. There are always mistakes that you can learn from. And if you're clever, you will learn from them. 
Otherwise, you're going to commit the same mistakes all over and over and over again. It, right. This is why this hobby makes you super organized. You know, I went, uh, I drove like 60 miles down in a country where I, I went down with my EQ5 man and I left my counter rates at home. Dude, Luckily, don't, you, don't go down that road. The amount of times <laughs> I've done stupid things like that. <laughs> You know, and you just there, you've been waiting for this occasion for about a month in a good case, and you're just there and you just ask yourself that really? Why can't I just make a list and just tick it? You know, if I'm that thick, you know, but you know, it makes you organized. And if you're the right person for the right hobby, you're gonna go for it. Exactly. So, um, Yes, I know we're over time, but that's okay because this is far more interesting than what I have to say half the time. Um, Doubt, but uh, yeah, we are over time. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so there's probably millions of more questions that could be asked. Um, I, I think just like with David Steinfeld earlier on, I could probably talk to you for freaking days upon weeks about this because it is this is still semi-new to me to capture uh, the ISS. Mm-hmm. Um, I, it's not new in a transit standpoint because I've done quite a few transits. In fact, I've hit virtually every single transit that I've ever shot. I've only ever missed one. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not bragging from that perspective. I will explain why I have never missed one uh, when I do my talk because mm -hmm. it is not about luck. It's all about planning. But I will go through that with it during my talk yes. when I do the transit side yes. of things. Yes. Um, how can everybody find you? Show your website one more time in case nobody was looking. Okay. <laughs> Which they should so, have been paying attention. <laughs> so it's, okay. So space station guys is the magic word, just like it says in the top. So this is the name you will find me on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook. Uh, I think, yeah, probably on Facebook. Um, what else? My YouTube channel called space station guys um and my website so that's that's you need to, that's all you need to know whatever whatever platform you're looking for me um that's the name you need to search for and then and then you will find me and so it's prob mm -hmm. probably Sorry. easier just to go to your website actually then isn't it yep 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 that's one way of doing it on my website uh you will see my uh twitter feed usually that i i keep sharing like like this brilliant, nice talk I'm having right now. <laughs> so I'm keep having, you know, I keep uh, sharing. So this is like Ralph Wanderberg's um, HTV9 he took two days ago, which is just, again, a mind-blowing shot. So yes, and here you will find everything. Guest photos, um, very talented people coming onto that quest photos. Um, one of them is just right next to me. Um, no, people can't see you like the way I do, sorry. So I shared one of your um, um, photos as well. And uh, yeah, so uh, again, I, I share people's photos as well. If you happen to have a good photo, um, send it to me. You will find the contact on the home page. If you just scroll down a bit, there's an animation and below that there's a contact email address. So just shoot me an email. And I'm more than happy to feature your photograph if, if it hits, obviously, a, a, a minimum level. Because it's all about showing people that it's real, it's feasible, it's doable, and it's beautiful. So are you looking forward to this launch tomorrow? I can't even ex explain how excited I am. You know, it's, 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 it's super historic. It's the fact that it's SpaceX. It's a private company uh, sending... So it's a private company that eventually is sending Americans back to space, um, let alone the only private company that's able to land first stages on a regular basis. So that's, that's contributing to sustainable and affordable um, rocket launches. Uh, the, 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 the Dragon Craft itself, it's a state of the art um, machinery. I, I, I can't, even put it into words how bloody excited I am, especially that the weather looks nice and yep. I can probably photograph it. <laughs> Plus, it's we're gonna webcast it, and yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait, seriously. And I hope I can show you some 
some sort of uh, you know what i think everybody here is probably signing up onto your instagram twitter the whole <laughs> nine yards you. right now um please if you don't follow this guy uh, uh, and you've only just heard about this recently, you really need to start watching what this guy does. You need to start looking at his website um, okay. and you will learn a hell of a lot. So for, like I said, when I started to get into this, this is one of the resources that I came across um, in order to try and figure a lot of these things out. And it's been extremely helpful because now I have a point of reference to compare um, against so the expectation is, is probably the best way to explain it is here's my shot here's this guy's shot what am i doing wrong so i can figure out what's going on and in all honesty it's not like these one-off things because that's one of the biggest things about astronomy that i don't um necessarily enjoy is the one-offs don't get me wrong i think it's great i think it's fantastic if you pull the shot off then you know you, you're some kind of unholy person or whatever the case may be but when you can't repeat something, that's the part that really annoys me or frustrates me. And this is the thing is, going through his site, you can see that these results are repeatable every single time. And you don't have to wait till the next you know, millennia for mm -hmm. something to happen. Okay, I mean, these launches are becoming more and more and more um, regular and routine that you can do. Jesus, look at, this, look at that Ross Cosmos shot. That is unreal. Yeah, so uh, the reason why I'm just showing this slide for the very end is because when I started, my goal was to actually take a photo of the ISS. Mm -hmm. And then once you reach a certain level and you can see that one spacecraft is dogged to the ISS, then you start thinking, hold on for a second, if it's, if it's visible when it's dogged, it surely must be visible when it's flying solo, isn't it? Because yep. it's, it's the same thing. Same principle, yeah. Exactly. So then I started taking, uh, so these are the four currently used cargo spacecrafts, all of them. So the Dragon, the Progress, the HTV, which is retiring with this HT9. So this is the very last HTV and the Cygnus. You can even see, look, you can see the tiny round solar panels, mm -hmm. you know. So, so what I'm trying to say is when, when I started it, I never even dreamt of getting into these heights, you know, of, of photographing satellites and uh, Starlink and, you know, like tiny. So we are talking about, so this, this, this uh, HTV, this is probably a size of a small bus orbiting Earth. You know, I mean, when somebody, if somebody says this three years ago to, to me or four years ago, I say, yeah, yeah, okay, get out of here. It's no way. And, 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 then, and then you are pushing your own boundaries because you are interested and that's enthusiast. Enthusiasm is half success. If you, ha if you don't have that, don't even, don't even get involved. How In many, astronomy how or many, any hobby. How many people um, do this, the ISS imaging out there, do you think? Because you know there's what? not really many of us. Um, what... what <laughs> What I'm realizing that it's, it's actually not that rare, but the level of, of they doing it, it differs, it varies between huge range. And I see that some people, they just don't like to share or they're not big on social media. And sometimes I got recommended by, have you seen this photo? Have you seen that photo? And I'm like, no. And I send the request and they're more than happy to contribute these photos. So I think there are way much, way more, many, many more people out there than we actually would think. But it's still a handful. It's yeah, still I, like thousands, probably. Not tens of thousands. Probably hundreds or thousands. I, I, don't, even, I don't even think it's that many, to be honest. I, I mm. genuinely think there's probably no more than maybe four or five hundred of us total. Mm. Possibly. I very, it's, it's really strange to not see other people's results. It's just weird. Mm -hmm. what, what, what is my particular favor is in the guest photos, I got some really high uh, magnification shots with that technology when the ISS was still being built. Those are one of my, because I wasn't around. And, and, and since I've been doing this, 
the shuttle is retired, so I, I I never gonna have the chance to take a photo of the shuttle with the ISS. Yeah, that's that's what bugs me as well because uh, there is a guy who has that as a transit with the ISS uh, with the uh, space station shuttle approaching the ISS. Thierry Legault, yeah, yeah, that's his and name. Mm -hmm. I've seen that shot dozens of times, but it really bums me that I will never get to see anything like that. Mm -hmm. Me too. So you see, here are some photos where there's only one set of solar panel on the ISS mm -hmm. on this photo, or um, so Martin Martin Lewis took. So you see, this is with the discovery. It's just yep. right there, docked. Or um, uh, he's got another shot. Yeah, this is another um, STS mission. I think it's yeah, it's Atlantis docked. So you see, it kind of breaks my heart because it was such a huge object. And you can imagine that how, oh, and he photographed an astronaut on spacewalk. Yes, I yes, I remember that one. <laughs> and they. And here's the funny thing. I see a lot of people said that was just nothing. It could have been something else or whatever the case may be, but oh. NASA actually yeah. confirmed mm -hmm. that that shot was actually correct. Yep, there are three of them. Three of them, Thierry Legault, Martin Lewis, and Ralph on the back. This is the three guys I know of who took a photo of, of, a, of a spacewalk. I missed it 10 minutes. Oh, really? Luca Parmitano was finishing, and he was riding on top of the Canadarm. Right. Imagine this. And the only reason why I couldn't photograph it is because these two guys, they finished the task ahead of the scheduled time. Ah, so they, they stitched you. <laughs> and by the time the flyby happened, Luca was in the airlock, in the Quest mm. airlock. Right. Like, no, probably. get back out there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, again, nuance, you know, it's just a tiny nuance detail that makes a success a failure or the other way around. Oh, that's just nuts. So I'm, I'm, it's just fun just to go through all of these pictures sometimes. <laughs> anyway, we can do this for hours upon end, but I need to have, I need to take my break and then I need to get ready for my talk after this. So mm -hmm. once again, Salbi, thank you very much for coming. Um, even though it was last minute type scenario and, you know, it's like on the eve of quite what would be quite a historical day. I'm so glad that mm. you were able to join me for this. Um, oh, and then obviously for everybody else watching. So any last words and comments? Any last words and comments for them? Grill me for the last minute. Grill you for the last minute. <laughs> Who knows what somebody is going to actually... Oh, I did miss a question. Oops. Is there a way to do this with the EQ6R Pro? Hmm. Okay, we, let's, let's rephrase this. Doing this with an equatorial man, I know you showed it ahead of time, but mm -hmm. I know where he's. I know where Richard Grace is getting to. Software that does this type of stuff. Um, he's referring to leapfrogging. Right, leapfrogging. Okay. Um, okay. So, so you mean you go ahead, you wait, goes ahead, yep. you go ahead, leapfrogging. Yep. Um, yes. Um, oh, who's who? Who's done that? Um, I'm trying to think of the name of the pro. I think it's called Star. No, Sky Tracker. Sage. Sage. Uh, hold up. There was there was one there was one gentleman who just shared on Instagram. Yeah, Sage. Yeah, Sage Photography. I think Sage Astrophotography. That's that's how you find him. He just did a, a very 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 good. Um, I think it was him. Sorry, I forgot the name. I th I think it was him. Did you post it on your site? Um, it's on Instagram. No, not yet. Uh, we are working on it, but oh, let let's me go find him on Instagram. Okay. Because he just did um, something relevant to this. And oh, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, on Twitter, I will find him. It's quicker because it's my message. And he was. Um... Oh, damn it. No, it's Instagram. Um... No, oh, it was Rich. Yeah, Rich. Rich Edis. Sorry, I was mixing him up. Yeah, I'm so glad that I looked it up. So that's Rich Rich Edis, and you can find him in Rich Edis Astro. So that's what he did. 
So this is with the leapfrogging method. And he asked me um, that what my opinion about it. I said I tried it a couple of times, but I'm, I'm, I'm the notorious constantly tracker. And he is now experimenting with going a bit ahead of it and then let it fly across. And then again, the leapfrogging. Um, so yes, for so the answer for the question, it's totally feasible and it's workable. It's not my method, but I always said that my method is not the only method. This is one method from the yes. many. You know, so, and to be honest, I'm more than happy um, to share this because uh, we are all different. Humans are different. And what works for some people, it doesn't work for the other. So yes, definitely. If the constant tracking doesn't make the justice for you, give this a try because this might work out. Yes. Good question. So answer to um, Richard, um, dep also, depending on the software, um, I know you can use uh, Stellarium as long as you have the correct TLE data downloaded. Mm -hmm. There is another software called Sky Tracker. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. th there's a bunch. You can just do a Google search. The mm -hmm. one that I use is actually Stellarium, although it's, it, I honestly think it's not the best thing because it has its ups and downs, but I did successfully track various satellites, not just the ISS with it. Mm -hmm. But it was, you know, touch and go, basically. Mm -hmm. um, somebody was asking about the um, the equatorial mount, and I, I, I think I have. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so because um, <clears throat> somebody just asked if it's possible with an EQ six mount, right? Mm -hmm. So you see, on this video, I was using an EQ five mount. So you see that the way it's set. You can you can flip it up to almost like an Altas mount. You yep. can, and then once you've done that, you see that the ISS is coming from here. So I did the setting so that is I, I can just turn around, I'm just, just turning and then moving the scope accordingly. So you will see, so so an EQ mount is a perfectly good tool for the tool for, for it. It's not the best tool. But if that's what you have, if you want to fancy manual tracking. Oh, so you, know. you just gave me a really interesting thought mm -hmm. that I'm you going see, to I test I spin out. around, uh -huh. but you need to test it. So you need to know what the flyby, the trajectory is. And then you just play with your mount as you set it up. You just you just move it and you just, you just replicate the same motion. You just gave me a really interesting thought on how to use an equatorial mount because it it still follows an arc or a straight line for lack of better description it doesn't suddenly go across the sky and turn right you know that's not what the iss does yeah it's um, predictable yeah it's predictable that's my point so here's the interesting thing the mistake is if you polar align it then you have to have two axes that move but if you can predict it you can almost position your equatorial mount in such a way where only one axis needs to move. Precisely. That's exactly to... what I tried to put through at the beginning of the talk. That that if ah. f forget forget which way the north the north leg uh, faces face right. And, yeah, forget that. You just want to use it for the best of your purpose. So you can set it the way you turn it around, and then you know you flip uh, the thing from. I am on 51 degrees. So you just go up or down. I, I forgot exactly which way. And then obviously you set, you lose your, your local setting uh, for your own um, uh, latitude. Latitude, yeah. Yes. Um, but in the same time, you know, and then you just turn it around. So if you know it's coming that way, because you it does this motion, this arc kind of motion again, but because the scope is like that on the top, you know, when it's low, it's pointing that way, and you just start turning around. And once you, once you have it, once you start playing with it, it all gonna make sense because then you will see that yes, it is still feasible, not as gonna, good as the Dobsonian, but I gotta ask you this actually. Sorry, um, another method, not to drag this on for any longer than it really needs to be. Um, have right. you actually used a laser to do this? A laser pointer. I know you might not be able to get away with it in the UK, but we can get away with it here in the US because it is not illegal to own one. It's illegal to point it at a plane. That's all. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, so since I live in London, so uh, by the way, 
all the photos we're taking for the heavy light polluted London. So if you think that you live in a city, this can be done, I prove you wrong. It's wrong. Um, all of you. <laughs> yep. So, um, but no, from London, definitely that's a no-go. They would, they, if, if I want to spend a night in a jail, then probably I should start it. Otherwise, it's a, definitely a no-go. But if you're living in a rural area and you don't bother anybody, could be a good idea. Yep. Yeah, I might give that a try as opposed to trying to use a Telrad. I mean, I know the you have to be in line with the laser beam itself because if you're a, a huge common mistake that people do with laser pointers is the beam is pointing out and mm -hmm. you're not actually standing directly behind the beam and parallel to it. You're standing off to one side. So your convergence mm -hmm. point is a different point. Um, and that's a common mistake that people make. You've got two eyes, remember. So your eyes will try and converge this one individual beam to one point, but the mm -hmm. point is actually a further away. So you still have to get behind it. It's just yep. a different method of doing it. That's all. But for aiming, it's perfectly well because yeah. you are behind it. So it's not, it's not a problem. Yeah. I mean, I've been thinking about, about inserting um, a camera to define the scope and then just looking at a tiny screen of some sort. But, but I tell you, the reason why I reject all these, because at some point it's becoming now my mission that I want to I wanna take my photograph with an equipment that X, Y, Z just can just walk to any telescope and say, okay, I need that uh, Dobson scope and that camera and this one, and I take it home and they can do exactly the same thing. There's no modification. There's no ele added electronics or anything. It's just a simple method that anybody can um follow right. and do the same thing cool all right we've definitely gone over time like there's no <laughs> tomorrow because like i said we will talk forever we're astronomers <laughs> man we that's what we do we talk exactly Unless okay shoot the guy down <laughs> yeah all right so if you want to find sabi uh go find him on his website um he will probably be up for another hour because i know you guys are probably going to start pestering him now so feel free to start messaging him because we all do so again i'm going to take a quick break because i haven't had lunch or gone to the bathroom or anything for that matter so i need to run off for a few moments mm -hmm. and so again thank you so much for doing this um would love to have you back another time thank you thank um, i really do appreciate for having me although it's almost midnight in the uk i don't promise that i'm gonna answer all the possible um <laughs> messages today because I need to work tomorrow and I have a four hour session uh, for the big, big day. Oh, so, how are we going to, how are we going to see that? How, how do you know we... what? I can send the link for you. So obviously we're going to talk Hungarian, but if you're going to start watching it just after the launch, I, I should appear at some point uh, as one of the hosts. And, and I try to bring in obviously to the live um, um, video, the results if i have any so are so, you doing so your live webcast is this on youtube is this on... it's gonna be on youtube yeah i'm, I'm the pro i'm broadcasting with four other guys who are in hungary and it's a joint sort of project well i will send you the link and if you want you can yeah i'll plug it. it yeah totally yeah, yeah. all right we will okay. see you guys again in thanks just for having moment. me all right good see night. you guys have a good one see you guys <laughs>